Thanks for being with us tonight. It's an interesting concept, isn't it, that the empty tomb is probably one of the largest visited tourist attractions in the world where people line up to see nothing. He's risen, and that's the good news. He's risen. Good news. Easter is the story of Jesus, who not only died on a cross for our sins, but on the third day was raised from the dead. Now, you can't top that, Buddha. You can't top that, Muhammad. Nobody else has a living Savior that died and rose again. So it's a story that ought to be celebrated and tells us you can't keep a good man down. I read this recently, and I thought I'd pass it on to you tonight. It was written by the mother of small children, and we got a lot of moms in here. She said, my kids are like camels. They can play all day in the blazing sun and never think about water. But at bedtime, as soon as their heads hit the pillow, suddenly discover an unquenchable thirst. She said, one evening, my three-year-old son and I had been through our regular night routine, a story, prayer, hugs. Then as my hand slid down the light switch, I heard, I want a gink. He couldn't say drink, which I thought was kind of cute, gink. But I was firm. You just had a drink when you brushed your teeth. Now go to sleep. At last, the kids were in bed, she said. Peace, silence. I sat in the best chair and started to go through the mail. I want a gink, from the darkness was shouted. Gink had lost some of its cuteness by now. No water, I said. Go to sleep. Quietness reigned for about 60 seconds. Mommy, I want a gink. Be quiet. I want a gink. She said, now I know how Moses felt in the wilderness with a million Jews crying, we want a gink. (laughs) Gink was no longer cute. I yelled down the hallway into the darkness, if I have to tell you one more time, and if I hear one sound from you about a gink, I'm going to come down and spank you. I'm not kidding. Now go to bed, be quiet, and go to sleep. Well, she said it was quiet as a tomb, not a sound. You could hear a pin drop. It was so silent, I couldn't concentrate on the mail. Then the still, small voice of a child who smelled victory cried, Mommy, When you come in here to spank me, could you bring me a gink of water? You can't keep a good man down. At 22, he failed in business. At the age of 23, he ran for legislator and was defeated. At the age of 24, he again failed in business. At age 25, he was elected to legislator. At the age of 26, his sweetheart died. At the age of 27, he had a nervous breakdown. At age 29, he was defeated for speaker. At age 31, he was defeated for elector. At age 34, he was defeated for Congress. At age 37, he was elected to Congress. At age 39, he was defeated for Congress. At age 46, he was defeated for Senate. At 47, he was defeated for vice president. At 49, he was defeated for Senate again, and at age 51, he was elected President of the United States. That's the record of Abraham Lincoln. Again, you can't keep a good man down. Some of you need to keep trying. In the mid-1950s, after being turned down by publisher after publisher and sending dozens of manuscripts to publishing companies, Norman Vincent Peale, in dejection, took the manuscript and threw it in a wastebasket basket. But his wife, Ruth, automatically reached to get it because they had worked so long and so hard and had spent so much time and so many of their dreams were in that manuscript. But as she bent down to pull it out of the basket, Norman Vincent Peale said, don't take that manuscript out of the wastebasket. We've tried, we've worked, but we failed. But the next day, While he was at the church office, Ruth picked up the wastebasket, because remember, he had said, don't take it out of the wastebasket. So she put the basket in a bag 
and took it to another publisher and said, my husband has worked hard. This is his manuscript. He looked at the bulky package and said, it doesn't look like a manuscript. But then he reached inside the bag and pulled the manuscript out and decided to publish it. The great book, The Power of Positive Thinking, was birthed that day. And since then, it's sold over 30 million copies. You can't keep a good man down. In Acts 2, right after the birth of the church at Pentecost, Peter preached his first message. It was an Easter message. And he said these words in Acts 2, verse 22 through 28. Peter continued, people of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus, the victorious, was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed powerful miracles, signs, and wonders through him. This man's destiny was prearranged by God because God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet it was all part of God's predetermined plan. God destroyed the cords of death and raised Jesus up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. This is the very thing David prophesied about him. I continually see the Lord in front of me. He's at my right hand. I am never shaken. No wonder my heart is glad and my glory celebrates. My mouth is filled with his praises and I have hope that my body, hope in my body, it's going to live because you will not let my soul stay among the dead, nor will you allow your sacred one to experience decay. For you have revealed to me the pathway of life, and seeing your face fills me with euphoria. Now, many were converted as a result of that message, over 3,000 men. They didn't count women. And Peter was saying, you can't keep a good man down. There are two things I want us all to note in this simple Good Friday message. Number one, doubt and doubters couldn't hold Jesus down. In John 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Let me pause there, maybe for you, family members, friends close to you, put you down, don't believe you have a chance, don't believe your dream could ever come true, and you'll find the worst criticism sometimes coming from people closest to you. Don't believe it. It says many in the day of Jesus did not believe he was Messiah. There were a whole lot of people who doubted. Even the brothers of Jesus did not accept him as Messiah until after his resurrection. And the people in his hometown of Nazareth were the most skeptical, the ones who had the most difficulty having faith in him. The religious community did not accept Jesus Christ. Of course, they didn't accept Chick-fil-A either. <clears throat> That's private, right? And Judas, one of his own disciples, betrayed him. Even for the disciples, although they followed him, it was not until after the resurrection their faith took hold. Only then did they understand who he really was. And that realization began to drastically, beautifully change their lives. Doubt and doubters couldn't hold Jesus down. One of the beautiful things about Easter is no matter how many doubts you may have, Easter always brings hope in the heart, causing that spark of faith that reaches out to Him. And that's why a lot of people who did doubt and are doubters on Easter weekend will say, I want to accept Him as my Messiah, as my Savior and Lord. See, people of doubt and doubters could not keep Jesus in a tomb. Your doubt is no intimidation to him at all. He's not shaken by your doubt or questions. Number two, death couldn't keep Jesus down. Acts 2 verse 24 says, God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. I love what he says in verse 24. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus down. In fact, many of the religious rulers feared the disciples would steal his body to fulfill his promise that he would rise from the dead. In Matthew 27, it says they came to Pontius Pilate with their concerns. 
And Pilate said to them, okay, you can have a guard, and I want you to go and make that tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the grave secure. Don't forget, they sealed it. They put a 2,000-pound stone in front of it, and they put a Roman guard, uh, several, in front of it. Not a chance the disciples could steal it. And I'm, I'm so glad that passage is here because some people would be prone to say, well, I wonder how Jesus did get out of that grave. Maybe the disciples stole his body. But this shows the tomb was as secure as his enemies could make it. But it was an impossible assignment because death couldn't hold Jesus down. You and I, who will eventually die, unfortunately, have hope that death cannot hold us down either. For the Christian, the sentence when I die, doesn't have a period at the end. You don't put a question mark there either, as though you're wondering, I wonder what will happen. And you don't put an exclamation point because it's not a surprise. We know it is appointed unto all men once to die. See, for the Christian, because death couldn't keep Jesus down, that statement has a comma at the end. And a comma means (laughs) death, it's not over that it will continue because Jesus rose from the dead. Because I live, you shall live also, he says to those who believe in him. Folks, if you know him as your personal Savior, then when you die, here's what Paul said, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. That's why when Christians leave this world, there's not the same mourning like there is with non-Christians. Oh, we sorrow, we cry, but not like those who have no hope. It's a sadness that someone is now gone from my life. There's a vacancy there. I'm going to miss this person, but I have the hope. I will be reunited. I will see them again. And we know we have hope of being resurrected. That's why Paul could go on and say, okay, death, make my day. Where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? He spit on it when he rose from the dead. He understood that when Jesus arose, he conquered the devil, he took power over death, and became victorious in life. And because he lives, you and I now have the promise that we shall live forever. Death could not keep him down. From the moment of Jesus' birth, Satan was trying to get rid of him. You know the story of Herod's attempt to kill all the male babies after the wise men visited He was trying to kill the Messiah. And by the way, just off the record, it says, Paul writing to the Corinthians, if the principalities and powers had known what they were doing, killing Jesus, they would never have crucified the Son of Glory. They were sealing their own doom. You know the time of Jesus' baptism. He goes into the wilderness. He's tempted The devil came trying to get him to take shortcuts so that he would not die on the cross. Every step of the way, the devil did his best to bring Jesus down. In fact, I believe that when Jesus died on Calvary, the demons rejoiced, not knowing what was happening, and the devil's legions cheered because Messiah finally had been killed and taken out of their way. Ah, sadly, then the third day came, and it came to pass, as David had said, You will not leave my soul in Hades. Jesus emerged from the pit after unlocking the chains of death and eternal darkness. And at that moment, he gave all of us who hope in him the hope of eternal life. Now, before the resurrection, you couldn't get the disciples up. But after the resurrection, you couldn't shut them up because they finally understood. They got it. Before the resurrection, they were afraid. After the resurrection, they were bold as lion. They had courage. Before the resurrection, they had a questioning mind. But after the resurrection, they had a confident mind. Before the resurrection, they were seeking direction. After the resurrection, they were giving everyone direction. That's because when Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples realized for the first time, hey, nothing is impossible. If Jesus can rise from the dead, then every problem I have kind of pales in lieu of that problem. Nothing to fear. And Jesus knew that man's greatest fear was death. 
So he took that fear away when he says, now boys, touch me, talk to me, listen to me, feel me. It's me. You've been with me three and a half years. It's me. Check the prints of the nail in my hands. Thomas wanted to put his hand in his side. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. Could, he had to touch it to believe, and then he believed. But he made sure everybody knew it was him. And then he hung around for over 40 days, teaching to over 500 at a time, so there would be clear evidence to document his resurrection from eyewitnesses still alive. So Easter gives us a new attitude about life. You know, Easter says to you and me, no matter what problem you have right now, God is able to fix that problem and meet that need. Easter gives hope. And I want you to think for a moment just this evening, what's the biggest problem you got in your life right now? Maybe a family problem. Maybe a physical problem. Maybe a spiritual problem. Maybe a financial problem. But no matter what it is, the good news, Easter tells us, if there is hope and that our God is able, because Scripture says nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Easter also changes our attitude about death itself. When we understand what Easter means, we begin to look at death from an entirely different perspective. I love to read stuff from kids. They're so brutally honest. And I picked this up and brought it tonight. Here's some kids' statements about death. This is Gilda. She's age eight. She said, when you die, they put you in a box and bury you in the ground because you don't look too good. <laughs> Stephanie, age nine, said, doctors help you so you won't die till you pay their bills. <laughs> Marcia, age nine, says, when you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher goes there too. Raymond, age 10, said, a good doctor can help you so you won't die, and a bad doctor sends you to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my favorite parts about the Easter story is Mary coming to anoint the body of Jesus. She saw the stone had been rolled away. There was nobody there to guard it. She's crushed because she thought, somebody's come and stolen my Savior's body. Then Jesus approached her, and seeing her grief and her loss, he asked why she was crying. She said, they've taken my master away. And I love this part. She thought this voice talking to her, because she wasn't looking, was maybe the gardener. She hadn't looked at him. But then Jesus called her by name, and he said, Mary. And immediately, she knew who he was. See, Easter is that time when God comes into your life and mine, and he speaks our name, and it changes our life. You know, Easter literally calls our name, and God declares He can change your life, He can change your marriage, He can meet your need. Every miracle in the Bible started with a problem. You cannot find doing a miracle in your life unless there's first a problem. So let me ask you a question tonight on Good Friday. How many of you have at least one problem? Okay, how many of you are sitting beside that problem? Ah, uh, you were doing so good. So listen carefully. If, if I were able to sit beside you tonight and share with you about someone named Jesus who could forgive you of every sin, give you hope of heaven, give you eternal life, and make a difference in your life now, so many would say, I want to know him in a personal way. Thank you for watching today's message. Subscribe today to be up to date on all of Pastor Rick's messages. And be sure to visit SummonSA.com for more information.